Now, patience is a big topic. I, it was kind of funny. I remember a couple of years back, I went to talk about patience because I was like, oh, I really need to talk about patience. And then I grabbed the last week's slides and lo and behold, I talked about patience. But it's been a while since I really talked about it. And in going through these old slides, I found these and I thought it'd be worth going through it again. Now, I like to dig around a little bit until I find the definition that I like the best. And I thought this one was pretty good. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. And that's pretty much trading because you have to tolerate a lot of delay, a lot of trouble, and quite a bit of suffering without getting angry or upset. Figure that out, write me a letter. <laughs> Leo Tolstoy once said, the two most powerful warriors are patience and time. One of the big things you need to do is give yourself the patience to learn. Someone contacted me today and they're in a bit of a pickle in a certain situation and they decide that they want to learn how to trade they want to come over here and spend a few days with me and i'm like that's fine i'm all in i'm always interested in someone who's interested in what i'm doing nobody seems to really care at least people that i know you know unless the market of course drops about 50 percent, then they call me in a panic what do i do it's like well you know what do you do what do you should have done you should have watched some presentations not that i'm the grand boom bob but should have watched some presentations or asked me before the bomb blew up. But anyway, long story endless. And it's, I said, that's ironic because tonight I'm going to give a presentation. This is five minutes after I found these slides where I talk about how long did it take you to become a doctor, a lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic. And I forget the, I don't know if it's Latin or Italian. It might be Latin, but, uh, and Cora, Empora, something. Jeez, I wish I could remember that. But it was Michelangelo at 81 said he's still learning. So definitely give yourself the gift of time. Now, some of my older presentations, I went on a kick for a while where I talked about the fact that in other methodologies, I'm sorry, in other professions and careers, there's a clearly defined career path. And the example I think I gave last week was a plumber where you have to become a journeyman and that takes a certain level to get to a journeyman. And then you do that for a certain amount of time. Then you take the plumber's master exam after being a journeyman for years. And I know someone who decided to become a plumber and I think that was probably 10 years ago and they're still not a plumber. So it's kind of interesting that there's a, a well-defined career path, of course, for an airline pilot, an airline pilot or someone else. Uh, something else like a doctor or whatever you have you have to have so much experience and go through so much schooling and all these other things but in trading there is none you just basically it, it looks easy right all you have to do is capture a price move you just open up account and get started but there is a methodology and there is money management and the most important thing is the mind and as i often say give me somebody with a good attitude as i said earlier as opposed to someone with with the smarts because the methodology can be learned and i'm going to show you some real simple things tonight and you guys who are here tonight live i think you probably know everything i'm going to show you but i think it helps to kind of refresh that it really can be that simple i never said it was easy but if you have a good attitude you could certainly learn a simple methodology and the money management is pretty simple too now, as far as a career path with a methodology, find something simple and use it. I could show you a couple simple things, something like a buy at B pattern and IPOs works really well. And I do really well with that. And some of you guys do even better than me from what I can see, from what I've seen in the Facebook group, something like a Landry Light pullback. If you need something a little bit more defined for a longer term, sort of the core methodology, trend trading. and uh, what I would encourage you to do is don't reinvent the wheel. Go on the grail hunt long after you find something simple that works. I'm on some grail hunts right now, as I've talked about recently and last summer, when it comes to volatility and trying to find these, what I call the holy grail days. 
and go in and watch prior presentations if you're having trouble sleeping at night on those. And so that's kind of a grill haunt for me, but I've settled into something. And as one of you guys pointed out, when you were doing your due diligence on me several years back, you found some posts from me going back to, I think it was 20 something years. And I was talking about the same thing that I'm actually talking about now. And I think the example was bow ties. We often talk about bow ties. We're gonna talk about bow ties here in, in a few minutes when we get to the live charts. Most people go on a grail hunt and eventually they find something simple. Well, I would suggest that you flip the script on that and find something simple and then go on your grail hunt down the road. Now, once you do find something, study at least 100 examples historically. Go in and find at least 100 examples. As I've said quite a bit, I don't want to throw anybody in the bus, but I was talking with somebody once on the phone and they were trading this pattern. I'm like, wow, when did you learn about that? And I was thinking that this is something they do all the time. And he's like, oh, I just read about it this morning. I'm like, oh, geez. Now, here's the hard part. And we're, we all, we're all, we all tend to be optimists. As a general statement, humans are optimists, optimists by nature. I mean, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, right, with a W. But you also have to play devil's advocate quite a bit. And I'm really good at playing devil's advocate with other people's stuff because I could shoot some holes in it because usually you can see it from a mile away because they're too close to it to see. Just like last week I talked about somebody presented me with a holy grail type of system and they wanted to start a hedge fund with it and they hired me on. And, and you know, I started looking at it and was like, first of all, you know, and I don't, I don't know if I told them outright or not, but the charts were looking ahead one bar and you couldn't see the one bar while they were looking ahead all his printouts were he thought that the little tick up was the time to buy but you didn't know the tick until the end of the next day that he was going to buy on that prior day's close anyway you gotta you gotta be your own devil's advocate or play devil's advocate i should say and then you want to observe in real time and have observe in italics because you want to see how it kind of shakes out in the real markets. The system designers call that walk forward testing. So you wanna do some of that in real time to see what happens. And I've come up with a lot of stuff over the years, especially way back in my programming days or when I did a lot of programming and I would come up with something I thought was great and I'd just immediately jump into the markets with it and get my ass handed to me because I realized, or I did realize fairly quickly that I basically had a perfect system that look back in time. But when it comes to trading, you trade forward in time. Now, I would urge you to keep things simple. The example I had from a few years ago was a simple buy at B pattern. This one's a buy at B, a little bit more complex, but not, not much. The fact that the high was set on day one, you have to close above that high in addition to a new closing high. So you can see new closing high on day five. Remember an IPO with the buy at B pattern. The earliest you would get in if it comes public on a Monday, the earliest you would get in will be Friday's close if that's a new closing high and a few other caveats. And if it's also above the day one high. Anyway, so it's not above the day one high. And then you can see it traded down for a while. And right about the time you forget about it, it begins to take off. And had a nice wide range bar higher. And it closed at a new closing high, which was also above the day one high. Now, I don't know for a fact, I forgot to check before it went live. This might have been a new closing high above that high, but the range was kind of small. And what I liked about it here, I said, keep it simple. Then I'm going to show you some complexities. That's okay. Some nuances will come out. And that's good. I like that the range expanded here, although the range was still a little small overall. If you go all the way back to the low right here, I like to see a little bit more range in an IPO. But as I said in Facebook, and I captured the post earlier, I didn't, I don't think I put it in the slides, but when we were talking about this one in Facebook, I remember saying that 
A, it was an expansion of range, even though the overall range was still a little small. But B, the banks were starting to trade like momentum stocks. And I figured that an IPO could be like a super momentum stock in that particular case. And then I also figured what's the worst could happen? It goes back down to new lows. It stops me out. So what? Okay, it's only point and a half or so. So here's the buy, my initial buy. And, I, and knock on wood, you know, I did this across multiple accounts. So there's the buy market on close. And then this is what happened afterwards. Too bad they don't always work this well. But luckily, it did trend nicely higher. And then I was able to get partial profits out of the trade. And now I am free rolling. So this is what happened afterwards. And there's the trailing stop, roughly, that I used. And then I got stopped out of it today. And it was 2067 where I got stopped out. The original trade was at 2094. So that's a gain of 773 times 400 shares left over. And the reason I only had 400 shares left over was I did take some profits along the way. So times 400 shares is 3092. So I took some profits when I was up almost four points or 3.71 points, only took 100 off. But it's one of those days where I just, for some, for several reasons, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Sometimes when they need money, sometimes when they have money. I just felt like it would be good to start peeling off a few shares in this particular case. And then somewhere along the line, in addition to the swing trade profit, there was a dividend or two. And I think it was about 50 bucks and better than the poking eye. So if you add all that up, this trade turned into 4513 luckily or fortunately i took it across multiple accounts so this turned out to be a pretty good trade and as peter brant brant once said recently well recently i learned that he said this and it makes a lot of sense he doesn't claim profits as his own until he closes out the trade and so now these are my profits they go into my account and i get to enjoy the fruits of my labor but very simple pattern, very simple money management, take that swing trade off and then trail a stop on the remainder, let it gradually open up so you can capture those longer term trends. And as I've said a thousand times, if you go in from the start and you just want to try to capture those longer term trends, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal and your accuracy is going to be pretty bad too. Maybe 27%, if you're lucky, will turn out into nice longer term trends. And that other 70 something percent, whatever it is, 77%, is that right? Will you'll end up losing on those trades and sometimes losing significantly. That's the problem because the reason is because if you try to if you tried to ride out a longer term correction, your stop would be that far away from the beginning. Whereas if you're just trying to ride out a swing trade, you can get away with a smaller stop and then make that gradual shift to the longer term trend. And I thought everybody knew that, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. But I was, and I've said this a thousand times too, I was on a project a while back. And one of the guys on the project, he was, at the time, he was running a hedge fund, but he's a brainiac. And he's like, that's pretty cool the way Dave's transitioning to the longer term trend trades by opening up his stops. And here's this guy that was a brainiac. And I just thought that everybody knew that. And apparently everybody doesn't. So that was very flattering for me. Anyway, when it comes to your methodology, your career path and your patience within your career path, you can shorten your learning curve greatly by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that means discovering truth by building on previous discoveries. I've had a lot of people take my stuff, take the ball and run with it, and that's fine. I think that's wonderful. So that was a, a little Wikipedia of somebody standing on the shoulder of a giant. So there's a lot of people who've inspired me over the years. Some of these people I've worked with directly some of these people i'm friends with some of these people died long before me 
before I was even born, I should say. But I've been blessed with being able to learn from a lot of different people. And I've learned a lot from people that I've never met. So it's not only, you can't say, well, you had an unfair advantage. And I guess in some cases I did with certain people on this list. But I also learned from a lot of other people. And I learned from some of these people before we even met them. So don't feel like, and that's, that's for some reason, people feel like they, get, they have to strike out on their own. They'll, let, let's say they come in and they'll be on my trading service or whatever. And after about a year or so, it's like, okay, I got it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on my own. It's like, well, you did okay, right? Yeah. It's like, well, keep me on staff. You know, I mean, I wish I had somebody doing the research. I know it sounds vain, but if I had somebody working as hard as I work, to try to find stocks and try to pick the best and leave the rest and all, I would have them on staff and keep them on staff. But for some reason, everybody feels like you have to go at it alone. And, and no, I learned from a lot of people. In fact, you know, just by accident, I, I, Mr. Perez, I thought that was kind of interesting what he said. I like, I like his attitude on that. And that's just that was just today. Obviously, you want to be aware of all the false claims out there. There was recently a lawsuit for 137 million. I always forget. Somewhere between 100 million and 137 million. And just to show, you know, just these guys were out there fleecing people. And, you know, of course, look at me on my rented private jet and driving my rented Lambo or whatever. There's a book called The War of Art. It's not about trading. I think it's Pressville wrote it. And Steve Pressfield, I believe is his name. And the book's about, a little spoiler alert, the book's about resistance. It's it's a real easy read. And they have a couple other his books here. I need to get around to reading. But you're going to encounter a lot of resistance in trading. I probably should just do, do a, a complete show on the resistance when it comes to trading. And I think I'm, I think I may have ha may have. And I where I talked about Marcellus Wallace and, you know, the night of the fight, you're going to feel a little sting. That's going to be pride, F pride and all this other stuff. Well, the day of the trade, you're going to feel a little sting. That's pride, you know, F pride. Anyway, the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. And as I've said quite a bit, any Duke in Thinking in Bets, a book I'd recommend you read, she talks about, and she she calls them by name. There's certain poker players that go up to the bar and brag, and there's other poker pro players that even if they won the game, they're they like beating themselves up, like, man, I could have done so much better. I played this hand so poorly. I played this hand so poorly, and so on and so forth. And not the last week at band camp, but one of the traders in St. Lucia said the same thing. You ever notice at the bar, the newbie trader is is talking about how great he is and what he did, and then the the more advanced trader or the well seasoned trader is like, oh man, it's like it's it's this is tough. And yeah, I did okay on this, but boy, it's been tough and I could have done so much better. 